Let's discuss soil as it relates to irrigation. This will be the third chapter of the Quell Qualified Water Efficient Landscaper course. And it relates perfectly to uh, what we're talking about with irrigating plants because we are not watering the plant. We are actually watering the soil. The plant gets its water from the soil. So we need to know what's going on there. So here we are with section three, soils. Today we're going to uh, become familiar with different soil properties, know how to recognize or identify different types of soil, understand how the water interacts with those different soil types, know how to monitor for soil moisture, have an understanding of common soil issues, and know the role of mulch and soil amendments. Soil is the unconsolidated mineral and organic material on the surface of the earth that serves as a natural medium for the growth of for the growth and anchoring of plants. Soil properties contribute to the rate at which water penetrates into the soil, the rate at which water is lost by evaporation, and the ability of the soil particles to hold water. And what is an ideal soil? The ideal soil uh, is a mix of solid material and then the gaps between the solid material. And those gaps we call pore spaces. And in the pore spaces, we want them to be filled with water and air. And so think about it like a sponge. After you squeeze all the water out, there's still moisture, but there's a lot of air as well. So the ideal soil is kind of like that. And then for the solid material, the vast majority of it is rocks, literally broken down rocks. And that's the mineral matter. And then we have the organic matter. And they say up to 5% organic matter is what makes a healthy soil. And the functions of soil as uh, a medium for growing healthy plants are often uh, damaged or degraded in certain instances, such as urban settings. And that's usually due to compaction, which they need to do in order to build the homes and roads and driveways. So the compaction of the soil uh, makes it difficult for landscapes to flourish. And healthy soil as an alternative, uh, does not have the compaction, therefore it has all the biology and the life that will be present with the presence of oxygen. And then that healthy soil can be used for cleaning and absorbing stormwater and maintaining plant health. So uh, we count on soil a lot. Soil sustains plant life and therefore all animal life. And it is the medium in which uh, water and nutrients flow into our plant. And we count on soil to be a filter of some sort. And uh, soil actually will immobilize and, and clean up contaminated water if there is plenty of uh, healthy living things in it. And as part of uh, nutrient cycling, meaning the elements that are present in our atmosphere and in our water and in our soil, they all go around in a cycle. And life helps to speed up that cycle. And so the, uh, the minerals go into the soil, they leave the soil, they come back into the soil. And that is part of what we call nutrient cycling. And then, of course, soils are the thing that we walk upon. So they provide, they provide support for plants anchoring their roots and for our human structures. So if we look at uh, the impact of different soil texture on water, we can see that if the particles are large, we call that a sandy soil then it will act differently than if the particles are very, very small. So small that we would call them a clay soil. Sandy soil, you'll see 
water move quickly through it because the pore space is large if the particles are large. And because it has really large uh, pore spaces, then it actually is bad at holding water because it's only in the micro pores that we have the ability to hold water. And the big spaces, the ones we call macro pores, are where the air is held. So sandy soil has more macro pores. And because the water drains so quickly, we will need to have shorter run times because if you let it run too much, it'll just go down below the root zone. So you wanna have shorter run times, but uh, you want to increase, therefore, your irrigation frequency so that you are able to provide adequate water to your plants. In a clay soil, by contrast, the water will move slowly through the soil. And clay therefore has high water holding capacity. And then from an irrigation perspective, uh, we will want to have multiple start times because if we try to put all of our water at once, it won't go in fast enough and it will run off the surface. So we have multiple start times in order to uh, allow the irrigation to what we call cycle and soak. And, and in this case, we need to irrigate less frequently because the soil will actually hold water for longer. So let's talk about different soil types. And uh, the first category of uh, soils that you can measure really is texture. And texture literally just refers to the proportions of sand, silt, and clay. And it can be made out of any mineral. So it's not telling you what kind of mineral it is. It's literally just a size determination. If you go bigger than sand, it's called gravel. And so as you get really small, we start to call that silt, and then we call it clay. The uh, relationship between the three is difficult to visualize because clay is very, very, very small. It's so small that uh, it's one particle of clay is invisible to the human eye. And so sand itself can be very, very small as well. A lot of times you look at something and it's so fine that you say, this has to be silt or clay, but it's still a sand. So the actual definition is anything between two millimeters and 0.05 millimeters is sand. And then you get down to 0 0.002, and that's silt. Anything less than that is clay. And it's, there's an important note there that soil texture cannot be changed. So if you have sandy soil, do not import clay. If you have clay soil, do not import sand and try to mix it in. Because what you're going to do is make concrete. That's how you make adobe, adobe bricks. So you live with whatever soil texture you have, and then you can amend it with organic matter. Because there are three categories of soil texture, we call those three separates because you can actually separate them out and measure them separately. And when you do that, you get uh, a percentage. So instead, if this was two components, we would have a line and there'd be like a spectrum along a single line. But because there's three components, it creates a triangle. And every single soil will be someplace on this triangle based on the percentage of their three different types of separates, your sand, silt, and clay. So in order to read the textural triangle, first you need to know what percentage of sand, silt, and clay you have. There's various ways to uh, separate them out. You can use fine mesh screens. You can use water and uh, a jar. You can use an instrument called a hydrometer, which is the most accurate. And you can even use your hands to come up with a pretty accurate reading. But if you have your percentages, you look at this soil texture triangle and you can place your soil somewhere on the triangle. So let's take a look at how it works. So for this example, we have separated out our different size particles and we found that we were at 40% sand, 
40% silt and 20% clay. And the texture triangle tells us that that is a loam. So notice how we have our numbers here in blue around the triangle. We start with number one and we look for the percent sand along the bottom. And what you do is notice how those numbers are angled. So we have 40% sand. Notice that the 40 is angled up and to the left. So we follow that light gray line up and to the left. And then we take our next separate and that is silt. And let's say we have 40% silt. Notice you find the 40 on the right hand side and it's pointing downward and to the left. So we follow the line downward and to the left. We find where those two lines intersect and we cross reference with the third side to make sure it adds up to 100. And sure enough, we're on the clay side, noticing how the numbers are oriented directly across. And so the 20% meets up with the 40 and the 40. And that puts us in to the loam category. So here's us reading the sand upward. Then we read the silt downward and we check it by looking at the third and we see that yes, in fact, it adds up to 100 and therefore where all three lines cross each other, that is where our uh, texture is. And in this case, it would be loam. So let's do another example. And in this case, uh, we're going to say we have 30, 35 and 35. So if we have 30% sand and 35% silt, notice how the numbers go up by 10. So we find where is the halfway point and we see where they cross. So let's verify that we have 35 on the third category. And yes, indeed, notice how we're up in the clay loam. So what changed? Well, we went from 20% clay to 35% clay, and that brought us up to a clay loam. Now we'll do the last uh, example. We have 60, 30, 10. So here's 60% sand, 30% silt, and you see that puts us in a sandy loam. So if we have 60 and 30, that adds up to 90. So therefore, the rest should be 10% clay. And yes, indeed, that gives us the sandy loam. So there's many more things you can test other than texture, but it's easy to do your texture uh, yourself with a field test. But you may want to send away for a professional lab analysis. And in that case, they can tell you other things like the organic matter content, the pH, the salinity, and the nutrient levels. Soil maps are available from a couple of different sources. And uh, one of them is the USDA Web Soil Survey. These maps were made starting in the 1930s and continuing through the 1970s. And after that, they stopped because they figured they had enough data. So you can look at this data and you can see what the world was like in the 1970s. And uh, if the land was not developed at that time, then there will be an accurate soil reading. If it was urban land at that time, largely they just uh, said it's urban soil and they created one large category for urban soils. So these resources are valuable for undeveloped land and it can give you an idea of what may be in the urban areas. But if your location was urbanized before the 1970s, you will probably not have much in the way of useful data on these uh, web soil surveys. One of the field tests that is recommended is a soil jar test. This is a very popular test that everybody does. And in theory, you put your soil in water and then you uh, can put in some detergent to help the particles not stick to each other. 
you shake it up and let it settle and then take a look. And from there, you're supposed to be able to measure the thickness of different soil textures and get a percentage to put on the soil texture triangle. The problem with this is that uh, you don't get layers as much as you get a spectrum. So where you start and where you stop is difficult to detect. And it's very hard to get an accurate uh, reading. There is a method that you could use based on time, how fast do the particles settle, and that would be much more accurate. The problem there is without a hydrometer, which is the scientific instrument, uh, it will be difficult to get uh, an accurate reading as well. So this is one of the more popular tests people do just to kind of see what your soil looks like when you separate out the particles but how well you can actually apply this to a soil texture triangle is potentially problematic. Much more reliable is the texture by feel method. And there's a USDA guide that's a pretty easy to follow flow chart. And basically you are playing with the soil and seeing if it can do the things that different textures of soil need to be able to do. So if it can make a ball, then you know you are not at the beach. You're not on pure sand. And then you try to form a ribbon and you have the soil suspended and held against the weight of gravity. And based on how far that ribbon can hang before it breaks, that will tell you how much clay you have. And then finally, your texture, whether it's gritty or smooth, will indicate whether you have silt or not so much silt. And with all three of those tests put together, you can arrive at one of the categories on the soil texture triangle. Now texture is something you do, you do not change. That is your percentage of sand, silt, and clay. And that is different than your soil structure. The structure is how those same particles are actually arranged and organized in the soil. So here it says soil structure is the arrangement of soil separates into soil aggregates. I mentioned earlier the presence of micropores and macropores. The micropores will be the spaces that are inside of an aggregate or a clump of soil. And the macropores will be the ones between other clumps of soil. So if you have good structure, you can have improved aeration, better permeability, as well as better water holding capacity. There's uh, many names for the soil structure type that you have. Three of the, the common ones are granular, crumb, and platy. And uh, crumb actually is not necessarily part of the regular list, but granular is ideal for horticultural purposes. You can even have no structure if it's been overtilled or uh, damaged, overgrazed. Animals can often cause no structure. Um, but the granular, the crumb like structure, where it just breaks down into a smaller aggregate that looks the same as the larger one. That's what you want, very friable soil structure. There's several videos on demand. A great resource is watersmartsd.org. And I highly recommend you take a look at some of the videos they have that help to outline uh, strategies for converting a residential property into a more water smart landscape, especially Let's take a look at episode five, six, and seven when it comes to soil. So let's talk about water and soil and how the two interact. Infiltration is the entry of water into the soil surface. So therefore the infiltration rate is the rate at which soil absorbs water from rainfall and irrigation. Once it infiltrates, then it percolates. So percolation is the flow of water through the soil. 
And again, there is a percolation rate that can be measured. And if the infiltration rate exceeds the percolation rate, you will have runoff. And so that's when the rate at which water is applied exceeds, exceeds the rate at which water can move into the soil. And we want to avoid runoff. Sandy soils have rapid infiltration and percolation rates. Clay soils have slow infiltration and percolation rates. And a loam soil, which is kind of a blend of different textures, is considered ideal because it is not going to lose the water too quickly, but you can apply enough water so you avoid runoff. Whatever soil texture you have, you can irrigate it properly. You just need to be aware so that way you can adjust your runtime accordingly so you don't either have overwatering past the root zone or runoff. In order to understand how water works in the soil, you kind of have to learn a little bit about the chemistry. And there's a water molecule, which oftentimes looks like a Mickey Mouse. It's a big circle with two little circles because it's H2O. So we have two hydrogens and one oxygen atom that are bonded together into a molecule. There's a special kind of bond for H2O and it has a charge, it's polar, meaning there's a positive side and a negative side. This positive and negative side is like a magnet and that's part of what enables water to act in its unique way. So water sticks to itself and it sticks to other things. And when water sticks to itself, that is called cohesion. When water sticks to other things, that is called adhesion. It adheres to other substances. Both of these forces are taking place in the soil. Cohesion results in the surface tension of water, and this is how water can form drops, for instance, on the leaf surface. And it's also why there's a such thing as capillary action. So soil is able to hold water and move it in directions against the force of gravity. When your plant roots take up water from the soil, they are pulling the water off of the soil particles. And as they pull water, it pulls more water because water sticks to itself. So it makes kind of a little chain of water that flows up and through the plant and then out the leaf. And that action is called capillary action. So the goal of irrigation is to restore the soil moisture to what's called field capacity and to maintain the soil moisture above the wilting point. So what happens after a rain is on the right-hand side, the soil becomes saturated. So all the big spaces and the little spaces fill with water. Eventually, gravity will pull that water down past the root zone and out to the, the groundwater or to any natural springs that are downhill. And you're left with water that is clinging to the soil particles. And uh, once the soil particle is totally covered with water molecules, then you end up with water that is sticking to other water that's sticking to the soil particles. And this is the only water that's available to your plants. And so your plants are going to be looking for water in this form. And anything that's left after gravity takes its toll, that water is going to hang out in that soil forever unless it is lost by plant growth or by evaporation. So the maximum amount of water that your soil can hold past the point of gravitational water draining down, that's called your field capacity. So it makes no sense to water more than field capacity because it's just water that will be lost. It's not water that will be taken up by your plant's roots. As the water in the soil is removed by plant growth and evaporation, you will start to take away enough molecules that the only ones remaining are hanging on really tight, hanging on with a pressure of 
more than 15 times atmospheric pressure. And then this water is unavailable to your plant. Your plant is not strong enough to create a vacuum to pull the water off of those soil particles. And at this point, we call it the wilting point because it is where your plant begins to wilt. And if it lives too long below the wilting point, the plant will die because it's no longer getting any water. And so you're always trying to go between your wilting point and your field capacity as somebody who irrigates. A few more terms. Uh, we've got our saturation point. That's where everything is filled with water. We've got gravitational water that drains away desaturated soil. What it leaves behind is field capacity. So we have air in most of the pore spaces and water clinging to the soil particles. That is what we call the available water. Uh, it can be absorbed by your plant roots. And once your plant roots absorb as much as possible, they reach the wilting point, meaning the water is no longer available. The water that's left behind will uh, be called hygroscopic water. It's not available to your plant roots because it's sticking too tightly to the soil and you will always have some water in the soil. It cannot be 100% bone dry. The amount of water you can hold between field capacity and the wilting point changes based on your soil texture. So a sand soil can hold less water than a clay soil. So if you can see the blue line that shows available water, notice how it is slim when you're in the sand texture. And then all the way on the right-hand side, you have clay. And then it kind of bulges out at the loam category. So what we have happening is that sand cannot hold very much water. It drains out too quickly. That's why it's so slim on that side. Clay, on the other hand, can hold the water, but it holds it much more tightly. So you can have plenty of water in your soil, but your plants will not be able to get it. In fact, you can have more water than plants can possibly get in the sand soil. But in a clay texture, it's just not available. So the loam is the perfect place where you have a lot of water uh, available, and that water is not sticking too tightly to the soil particles. It's kind of the Goldilocks situation. So here's a poll. When most of the available water from the soil is depleted, the soil reaches capillary action, wilting point, field capacity, or saturation point. That's right, you reach B, the wilting point. So here is a table that is showing the same information that you saw on the graph previously. And based on different textures, you have different volumes of water that you can hold. The number on the left is the lower level of available water. And the water on the right is the higher level of the available water. So you can see that in very coarse sands, your plant can only absorb uh, between 0.75 and 0.4 inches. So it doesn't make sense to irrigate any more than that at a given time. Compare that all the way down to clay and notice that you can have 1.6 inches in your soil, but your plant cannot get that. You need to be above 1.6 inches for that water to be available and all the way up to two and a half inches, your, water, your plant can get the water above that, then you have your runoff and unavailable water. So you're always trying to stay in between this as far as inches of water are concerned. When we schedule irrigation, we schedule it uh, with time, but we're thinking about it in terms of inches, similar to precipitation. So this is a dynamic factor, it's always changing. You never have a solid uh, permanent condition of water and you're always wanting to be able to check it. Over time, as you irrigate, the water that you apply will leach 
minerals and nutrients away from the root zone. You can also leach salt, which is a good thing in terms of growing crops typically, although that salt's got to go somewhere. So if you leach salt down for too long, eventually catches up to you at the top and then you've salted the earth and that will take thousands of years to repair. So you want to be cautious when it comes to over irrigating because you will remove the minerals that are water soluble from the, the root zone of the soil. And this is part of why uh, when we irrigate, we also need to fertilize or we need to think about reapplying minerals in the place where the plants can get them. So let's talk about how to monitor soil moisture. A couple of tools we use. One of them is a soil probe. It's used to take soil sample at depth and you get a little bit of a core sample where you can look down at different lengths and see is the soil moist? Is my irrigation getting down to the depth that I think it should be? Uh, you, can, you, you can buy a soil probe or you can also go to the dollar store and pick up the Apple Core device which is basically the same thing, but it's cheaper and it's a little bit smaller, so it's easier to pack in a field kit. So you use it for a visual examination. Then we have a tensiometer, and this is used to determine the availability of water in the soil. There's a few different uh, styles, but the, the image shows uh, a professional grade tensiometer. And then you have soil moisture sensors that are, some are related to the tensiometer and some are uh, using different technology to detect water. And these are sensors you add to an irrigation system. And basically it's an off switch. So if the sensor detects moisture, even though your controller would try to irrigate, your sensor will override and will cancel the irrigation. So it's a way for the irrigation to not run if there's already plenty of moisture in your soil. And these do work well, and they are encouraged. The only caveat is that your soil is not one thing. So if you only have one sensor, you might have that one sensor only reading accurately for that given area. So if you have a large site, you may need multiple sensors, or you may need to reconsider uh, whether or not you allow the sensor to turn your irrigation off for you. Let's talk about some common soil issues. One of the main ones is soil compaction. So this occurs when you walk on the soil too much and there's heavy machinery, foot traffic, excessive tillage, all of that will lead to compacted soil. When you have compacted soil, you have destroyed the structure and therefore you lose your porosity. You have lower aeration, lower percolation, uh, less water holding capacity, less oxygen, and everything's more difficult. So the, the way to cure this is to stay off your soil and to add a, organic matter. And you can do some light tilling in order to open up soils in certain circumstances without doing damage. The other problem is erosion. The two often go hand in hand. Compacted soils will tend to erode because the water does not infiltrate. Uh, but erosion is a little bit separate because it can also be done by wind or anything that is going to uh, have a force applied to the soil surface. And raindrops can cause lots of erosion. There's actually quite a bit of force behind a, a raindrop. And wind can do it as well. Human foot traffic can do it. And uh, if it's on a slope, of course, you are especially susceptible to erosion. So the way we prevent erosion is by keeping a good soil structure so that water can infiltrate, and then mainly by covering our soil with vegetation or mulch. Try not to have exposed soil because there's nothing you can do to prevent that from eroding. It, gravity will take it downhill one way or another. And then your soil pH is another consideration. Uh, you can apply all the fertilizer in the world, but if you have uh, an imbalanced pH, then that fertilizer will not be available to your plants. So pH is a scale that uh, is a determining factor on how acid or alkaline uh, your soil is. And 
most uh, of what we want is right in the neutral range. And in this case, neutral is seven. It's a logarithmic scale. So every number up or down you go away from seven, you multiply by 10. So eight is 10 times more alkaline than seven and nine would therefore be 100 times more alkaline than seven. So as you go out into the extremes in number, you are getting exponentially higher levels of acidity or alkalinity. And for our purposes, if you look at this graph, you can see uh, many of the essential nutrients. It's not all of them, but many of them. And the, the width of the blue horizontal line represents the general availability of that nutrient. And so as the line gets thinner, it is less available to your plants. And in general, we see the macronutrients are up top, meaning that we, our plants need those more than any other. And the bottom are the micronutrients. And if you can see a general pattern, you'll notice that in acidic soil, you tend to be deficient in the macronutrients and you'll have plenty of micronutrients. But in the alkaline soil, you may have plenty of macronutrients but your micronutrients, those lines get thin. And the perfect place to be would be 6.5, uh, just very slightly acidic. Uh, seven's pretty good too. In San Diego, we are typically on the alkaline side and I've had soil as alkaline as nine pH when I've done tests. And in that case, you are definitely limited on some of your trace minerals and in particular, you notice it most with iron. So you can do a simple uh, soil pH test. This is similar to how you test the pH of a swimming pool. You basically make a soil solution with water, and then you apply that liquid to a uh, paper, and the paper reacts. And based on the pH, it'll change to a color. That color tells you where you're at. It's not... Uh, Super accurate, but it's accurate enough for most people's purposes. And in general, you can guess that you're on the alkaline side because our climate kind of makes everything alkaline. And what that means alkaline for uh, soil purposes is that salt builds up in the soil. There's not enough rain to wash away the salt. And when that happens, we tend to have higher pH and buildup of salt and salinity. So there are different kinds of salts. Uh, anything that we apply as a mineral fertiliz fertilizer that goes in the form of water is a salt, meaning it's soluble in water. It will dissolve. And uh, salt buildup, we can think of as really sodium buildup, table salt. It is toxic in certain doses. And some plants have adaptations to deal with salt, but uh, in general, if you have salt in your soil, you're gonna have reduced ability to grow. And by the time you see the white crystals of salt forming on the surface, uh, that, won't, that won't be good growing soil for most regular types of plants uh, in your lifetime, certainly. Uh, that's beyond repair. A lot of the soil, the agricultural soil in the Central Valley has been salted. And once that happens, uh, you got to move on to a new place. And if you don't change your ways, you're going to salt the new place too and leave behind desert. So here it says leaching techniques can be effective in reclamation of salt affected soils. Basically, you pour a ton of water on it and all that salt will leach down past the root zone. But remember what I said, where does it go? It doesn't go away. It just stays there. And if you do that over and over and over, and you have the risk of rising the water table, if you let the water table get within 18 inches of the surface, then you have a runaway situation where the water table is so high that now evaporation is happening. And you'll just have water leaving all the time, but leaving behind the salt. And this happens in deserts when we irrigate the desert. Uh, the water table oftentimes is not very low, not very far below our feet. In many places in the desert, in our San Diego desert, you dig down five feet and you're at the water table. 
And so if you allow that water table to rise by irrigating, especially if you're leaching salt, uh, that water table gets up to 18 inches or less to the surface. Well, you've just done something irreplaceable and you've created a bad land. You've created the Sahara Desert and nothing can repair that but geologic time. So be very careful with uh, large agricultural operations. Ideally, we want to irrigate as little as possible. We want to have proper plant choice. And in dry areas, preventing evaporation from the soil is imperative. How do we prevent evaporation? Well, we apply mulch. So here's a poll. Select all that apply. So here's some do's and don'ts with mulch. Uh, do use organic wood chips, leaves, and grass clippings. Uh, you can use inorganic mulch like pebbles and gravel, although you're going to need to do a lot of maintenance to keep the plants from growing out of the gravel. Uh, you want to apply it in, it says a two to four inch layer, I say four to six inch layer. You want to go deep with your mulch. Reapply the organic mulch periodically, once a year, once every other year is all right. Oh, if leaves fall from your tree, if possible, leave them in place because that's a good idea. It's free mulch. You, know, you want to be gentle with the use of a power blower or with a rake because you don't want to spread the mulch around unnecessarily. And you may want to consider leaving some areas without mulch so that way the wildlife that needs exposed soil will have access to habitat. Uh, don't mix the wood chips into the soil. All you're going to do is really just lock up nitrogen from the soil and instead it goes toward breaking down the wood. It'll get released later, so it's not a huge problem, but in general, it's not a good idea. Don't put mulch right next to the trunk of trees or shrubs because you can actually cause decomposition of the bark. Uh, don't use plastic mulch because it breaks down and results in pollution. Don't blow or rake up every leaf and don't blow or rake up the mulch. Mulch is good. Leave it in place when you can. A lot of benefits of mulch. It uh, inhibits weed growth and weed seed germination. Uh, weeds will still grow through the mulch, but the ones that do will be easy to remove. Mainly you're retaining moisture, preventing evaporation. If it's organic mulch, then it will add organic matter over time, which will improve the soil structure and uh, can reduce soil compaction. It prevents soil from getting really hot or really cold. And uh, depending on what type of mulch you have and how steep your slope is, it can help to reduce erosion, although that benefit is largely overstated. If you put mulch on a slope as a as a preventative for erosion, you will likely still have erosion. And it could be happening right under the mulch. So be cautious about trying to use mulch to reduce erosion. There are other techniques that are more appropriate. Uh, there's compost, which is different from mulch. Compost is the decomposed organic matter. So anything that came from a plant, if it was once alive, it can live again. Uh, you take your landscape trimmings, food scraps, uh, put water on it, and then it, by giving it time, it will turn into humus, humic acid, basically the byproduct of a bunch of microorganisms breaking it down. Commercially, they make sure that it gets hot so that it kills and sterilizes uh, against pathogens and kills most of the weed seeds. They use heavy machinery. They put it in big windrows. And this material is available at the landfill for delivery or pickup. Uh, so you can use compost as an amendment to your soil. In, in place of compost, you may also put manure or biochar. Biochar is a special type of charcoal, which creates habitat for microorganisms, similar to compost, but does not have the nutrients it, in, its, in and of itself. Instead, it has the space for the nutrients to uh, be stored. Gypsum, lime, and sulfur are used for different soil pHs in order to help to bring it into neutral and to help uh, open up heavy soils. So you will use amendments if you need to improve the soil structure, fertility, or the water holding capacity. 
And typically you'd want to get a soil lab analysis and that analysis will tell you how much of each of these amendments to add. So let's go over the review questions. So make sure you review these questions, look up the answers in the manual if you don't feel comfortable with them. You will see questions just like this on your certification exam. And here's our second half of those questions. Feel free to pause the video, read through, look at the PDF and make sure you are able to answer these. So there we go. There's our uh, soil chapter in the Quell curriculum. I hope you found it interesting and informative and perhaps useful in your daily life and refer back to this lecture or to any of the print materials to help you in your supplemental study. It's important to understand soil in order to understand irrigation because what we're doing is watering the soil.